So thanks so much for for inviting me to present. It's it's great to be here, even if just via Zoom. Hopefully we can do it in person sometime again in the future. So this is joint work with Darona Semoglu, and in this paper we are thinking about how technology shapes the wage distribution and affects inequality. So let me start by providing some of the facts that I'm going to be trying to think about during this presentation. This figure plots changes in wages since 1963 for men in the left panel and for women in the right panel. And it also distinguishes between groups with different levels of education using different colors. And so what I want you to take away from this figure is that when you look at the wage data, it looks like all workers in society were experiencing healthy wage growth before the 80s but that starting in the 1980s, we see a fanning out of the wage distribution. What's also very interesting and important is that even though you start seeing healthy wage growth at the top, especially for women with postgraduate degrees, you start seeing a stagnant or even decreasing real wages for other groups, most notably men with low levels of education. So in this paper, we are going to argue that a sizable share of these changes in the wage structure that I just presented are due to the uneven effects of automation on different groups of workers. And the way in which automation technologies work is by displacing a specific groups of workers from some of the tasks that they used to perform. So think, for example, of men without a college degree being displaced from some of their tasks by technology. And in the theory that I'm going to present, this always reduces their relative wages. But importantly, I'm going to argue that this can also explain why we see a stagnant or even decreasing real wages for these displaced groups of workers. I also want to emphasize that the explanation that I'm going to bring today is going to be very different from traditional theories of skill bias, technical change, or capital skill complementarity. So if you think, for example, of Katz and Murphy or Crusoe, Lohanian, Rios, Rule, and Violante, the main mechanism generating inequality there is that technology complements directly a skilled labor. So technology makes skilled workers more productive, and this increases inequality. Instead, in our explanation, we are going to abstract from these complementarities, and instead we are going to emphasize the possibility that automation technologies, which is one particular type of technology, can display some groups of workers from the production process. And this is always going to reduce the relative wages, creating inequality, but could also reduce the real wages, which is something that traditional theories of inequality have trouble explaining. So in particular, in this paper, I'm going to make this case in three parts. First, I'm going to present you with a general framework to think about the effects of automation. And this framework is going to clarify what we mean by automation and why automation is different from other technologies and why our model is different from previous models of skill bias technical change. And the main thing that comes out of the model is that we're going to be able to show that real wage changes for one specific group of workers are going to be tightly linked to the extent to which these workers have been displaced or have lost tasks to automation, what we call the task displacement experienced by that group. The second part, I'm going to show that this task displacement can be actually measured. So this is going to allow us to take this model to the data. And so in particular, I'm going to be able to produce measures of how many tasks have different groups of workers in society. Think again of young men without a college degree. How many tasks has this group lost to automation in the last 40 years? And with these measures, we're going to be able to test the implications of our model, both using reduced form evidence, but also doing a more quantitative exercise. And we are going to show that in line with our theory, these measures of task displacement predict which ones are the groups that are experiencing relative wage declines during this period. And in the quantitative exercise where we are going to use our model to quantify how important this force has been, we are going to show that the uneven effect of automation on different groups accounts for close to 50% of the observed changes in the wage structure that I documented earlier. 
And more importantly, I'm going to show you that this model is capable of explaining why some wages have fallen in real terms and why, despite the fact that we are seeing rising inequality, productivity growth has been lackluster. So you're going to see that in our theory, automation can generate a lot of wage dispersion, even though the aggregate PFP gains from automation are going to remain quite modest and small. And this is important because since the 1980s, precisely during this period where we've seen all of these rising inequality, it has been also a period of slow productivity growth compared to the earlier period between the 1950s and the 1980s. So the plan for the presentation is the following. I'll start with the model. Then I'm going to explain how we can measure this task displacement, which remember is the extent to which different groups of workers have been losing tasks to automation. And then I'm going to describe some reduced form evidence and I'll conclude by briefly talking about the quantitative exercise where we use the full structure of the model to quantify the general equilibrium effects of automation, both on the wage structure, but also on TFP and on wage levels. So if there are any questions, this is actually a great moment to ask them before we jump to the uh, model and the framework. Pascual, uh, feel free to 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 postpone this uh, question for later if it's not the right moment. But but sort of more from a historical perspective, um, would there be something special about automation relative to other technologies in the past that has uh, have sort of potentially similar effects on 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 the, in terms of displacing workers, in terms of thinking more in general about capital labor or substitution and so on. Would there be something special about automation or that this is just the top technology that we have these days and that's just what we're seeing now? Yeah, absolutely. I think that there's nothing special about automation. I think it's essentially what, what you're saying right now is just that it happens to be the case that since the 80s, this type of technology has accelerated and has created these adverse distributional effects. But you can think of many instances, historical events in the past, for example, the mechanization of agriculture, or you can also think of some transformations of the textile industry during the Industrial Revolution through the lens of our model and the implications of our model are going to be the same. It's going to be those groups that are getting displaced by those technologies. Those should be the groups that are experiencing losses in relative wages. And you do see some of that historically, which is interesting. So, for example, during the Industrial Revolution, uh, the automation of textiles using or the mechanization of textiles, to be more precise, using spinning and weaving machines. That affected one particular group of workers, which was skilled artisans. So our theory would suggest, well, skilled artisans should see a reduction in the relative wages at this point. And those were precisely the workers that were going out to the streets to smashing machines and became Luddites, right? So like, I think that, that you can apply the same theory to previous waves of automation. And what's interesting of the recent period relative to the period before the 80s is just that the extent of automation has accelerated and perhaps other technologies that in the past counterbalance the effects of automation are not as strong as they used to be. So that's one potential interpretation of what we are going to do when we put it into like a broader historical perspective. Okay, thanks. Yes. This is Ernesto Pastor from the bank. Hola, uh, Ernesto. Hola. So about automation, uh, I understand that it's been accelerated through time, but looking forward, could we think that it's going to play the same role as it's been playing before, as opposed to other type of technologies that maybe are especially intensive on the use of unskilled labor? For instance, I'm thinking about Amazon that has been building this empire based basically on exploding uh, low skilled labor or Uber or other sort of applications that are doing exactly that, taking advantage of low skilled people and actually the, the wages may be raising so much in that in those applications that now probably struggle to find those workers for the formal sector mm has -hmm. probably started in everywhere in the world. Yep, absolutely. So that's that's also like a great question. I think that in our model, and you're gonna see it in a second, automation is gonna be very different from what you're describing because automation is gonna be a technology that lets you produce without those unskilled workers. And so you can think that there are two types of technologies. There are technologies that allow you to automate roles for labor and produce in a way that is more capital and more skill intensive. And there are new products or new industries being created that 
managed to absorb all of those unskilled workers. And going back to Fed's question earlier, so you can think that historically these two types of technologies have roughly balanced each other out. And then what we've seen during the last 40 years is that automation has outpaced their rate of creation of these new jobs or industries for unskilled labor. And so there's an upper question about what's going to happen in the future, right? Is Amazon and Uber going to manage to finally create a balance between automation and these other types of technologies that introduce jobs for unskilled workers? Or is this race going to be won by automation? And that's more into the future. So like, I don't have the answer to that, but, but you're thinking about it in the right way. It's a race between two types of technologies. Okay, so let's get started with the model. So we're going to use something that is called a task model. So what's the key idea in a task model? Well, the idea is actually simple. To produce any given product, you need to combine different tasks. So for example, if you want to build a car, you first have to design the car, then you need to bring the parts together, then you need to assemble the parts, weld them, paint them, code them, then you need to take the car, distribute it, and then sell it, right? So all of these tasks have to be assigned to workers with different skills, or increasingly, many of these tasks are being assigned to capital. So for example, in car manufacturing now, the welding, is being, the welding and the painting is being done by robots. Some of the sales are being done by software, but other tasks are still done by humans. So for example, unloading the materials from tracks, that's still done by humans, and the design part is done by humans, and so on. So how do we capture this assignment problem mathematically? So the way that we're going to do it is, and I'm going to start with a version of this model that has a single sector. And the way that I'm going to do that is that I'm going to assume that output is produced by combining different tasks. These tasks are indexed by X. There's a mass M of these tasks, and they belong to some set T. And these tasks, or the quantity of these tasks, Y, X, is then combined via a CES aggregator with an elasticity of substitution lambda. So that's kind of like standard. The interesting bit is in the equation in the middle, which tells us what are the technologies available to completing each of these tasks. So the equation in the middle is telling us that task X can be completed by using one of several types of labor indexed by G. So LGX is the total amount of labor of type G. And again, think of G as a type or a skill group or a demographic group in society. And this type of labor has a productivity psi GX at that task. So that task is specific. And what this is capturing is the fact that different groups have different comparative advantages at different tasks. And then there's also a common component AG, which is essentially a factor augmenting technology making group G more productive across the board at all tasks. So the factor augmenting technologies is the usual way in which the literature has thought about technological progress. So technology is something that makes skilled workers more productive or unskilled workers more productive. And here we are going to also be thinking of the role of the PSIs, which are technologies that change the productivity of certain group or of capital at a given task. And you're going to see how that allows us to think about automation in a very clear way. You could produce this task with labor, but you could also produce these tasks with capital. So that's the first term. So think of capital as basically robots, software, or specialized equipment that is designed specifically to complete that task in an automated way. And in particular, the productivity of capital in that task is going to be Psi KX. You could think of Psi KX being zero for tasks that cannot yet be done with capital. So we like to think that perhaps research and teaching, those are tasks that algorithms cannot do. So we are going to imagine that Psi KX is zero for those tasks. But in the future, maybe Psi KX increases due to advances in artificial intelligence. And those are the types of dynamics that we want our model to capture. And capital two has a factor augmenting term AK. What about factor supplies? Well, capital, we are going to be thinking as an intermediate. So capital is produced from the final good at a rate QX. So you could also think about this as a steady state of a dynamic economy, but it's produced from the final good. So capital is supplied fully elastically and depreciates immediately. So this is going to be essentially a static model. Labor is going to have a fixed supply LG. 
And the key assumption that we're going to make, this is not super important, we relax it in the paper, is that the total amount of labor in each group is fixed. So people are not acquiring new skills over time. They're not becoming more educated over time in response to these changes. You could uh, uh, generalize the model to account for this, but we're not going to do it in this presentation. And the second assumption is that there's no unemployment. So these workers are happy to supply all of their labor. And you could also imagine what, hap what would happen if you introduce some frictions and all of that. And I can discuss that at the end, but I want to keep things simple to emphasize how technology affects wages. So given these definitions, then you can think of an equilibrium simply as an allocation of each of these tasks to the factors of productions that maximizes net output. So this is going to be an efficient economy. There's no misallocation. And because I assume that capital and labor are perfect substitutes in producing the same task, which again is capturing the idea that a robot welder and a human welder can do exactly the same thing then each task is going to be allocated to a single factor of production. And that's going to be convenient for thinking about how technology affects the production structure of this economy. In particular, we show in the paper that there's going to be a unique equilibrium allocation. So this is the way that I want you to think about this. Imagine that this bubble right here represents the entire set of tasks in this economy. And an equilibrium is therefore just a partition of these tasks into some tasks that are allocated to worker G, other tasks that are allocated to worker G prime, and other tasks that are allocated to capital. Now, of course, this is an example with only two skill groups, but you could think of many skill groups. You could also think that this is more general than this picture. So like the sets of tasks allocated to each worker, they do not need to be convex or connected or anything. So any crazy allocation can be happening in the back. But the point is that there's going to be a unique allocation. And what's going to guide that allocation is comparative advantage. So workers are going to specialize in tasks where they have a comparative advantage. And we are going to use capital in tasks where it has a comparative advantage. Now, given this equilibrium allocation, I'm going to define an object which we call task shares, which roughly speaking captures the importance of the tasks that are allocated to group G. And these task shares, you're going to see that they're the key object governing the distribution of income in this economy. So they're going to be very important. And so I want to take a minute to go over their definition. The task share for group G. So this is an equilibrium object, is an integral over the set of tasks that are allocated to that group, which essentially captures the productivity of workers in those tasks and the price of those tasks. So it's essentially a measure of the importance of the tasks allocated to group G. So which groups are going to have a high task share where that's going to be precisely the groups of workers who have a comparative advantage at plenty of tasks that capital or other workers cannot do. Those are going to be the workers who get lots of tasks allocated to them. And we are going to see that those are precisely the workers that command a high wage on equilibrium. So again, think about technology, the size determining an allocation, and this allocation determining these task shares. And I'm going to show you in a second why these task shares are so important. The reason why these task shares are so important is that you can show that we can represent the equilibrium of this economy as essentially a CES production function of the different types of labor. So remember that I started with a CES in tasks, and now I'm showing that I can aggregate the CES in tasks and obtain a CES, but on the different types of labor. So that equation at the top shows that output is essentially a standard CES production function, but with two key differences. The first key difference is that the CES shares, the gamma g's to the one over lambda, those shares are now endogenous and pinned down by the task shares. So that's key difference number one. And you can start already thinking about technologies that displace workers from some of their tasks. So that's going to reduce their gamma Gs. And that's going to be essentially a technological shift that reduces their weight into the production process. 
Okay, so going back to Ernesto's question, that's going to be very different from the business model of Amazon or Uber, where you could imagine that unskilled workers actually have a very high weight. And so what automation technologies allow some firms to do is to produce by putting a lower weight on some groups of workers, which effectively they manage to automate. The second reason why this is not a typical CS production function is that term at the beginning. That term at the beginning, don't worry about it, it's just a technical thing capturing the fact that capital gets produced from the final good. And so this makes production roundabout. And so this is just capturing the roundaboutness of production and the fact that you get extra output from this. Now let's think about wages, which are the key object that we want to think about in this presentation, the wages of each of these groups of workers. This is an efficient economy. This is a competitive equilibrium. And so wages are just given by the marginal product of labor, which in this case is just output per worker raised to the one over lambda. Then the productivity of that type of labor, so that's the AG term raised to the lambda minus one over lambda. And the reason why uh, this is this is essentially like if you ignore the gamma G, that's essentially the key equation that people have used in the past to think about inequality. So that's the key equation in Katz and Murphy and so on. And in those models, the AGs can affect wages, but they're going to have an ambiguous effect on wages, because if I make a group of workers more productive, on the one hand, that increases their wage, but on the other hand, that reduces the price of the tasks that they produce. And this price effect, which is captured by the minus one that you have there, is going to dominate when the elasticity of substitution is less than one. Okay, so that's why those technologies are going to have an ambiguous and in general, a small effect on wages. But now you have the third term, which is the gamma G to the one over lambda which is what our theory is bringing. So essentially, previous theories think of this as an exogenous object, but we are saying, no, in a task model, these shares are endogenous. And you can immediately see that if there's a technological advance in capital that allows machines to take some tasks away from your group, that is going to reduce your gamma G because you're going to have fewer tasks allocated to your group, and that's going to push your wages down. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that your wages are going to go down in equilibrium because there are also complementarities. So the tasks that are automated are complementary to other tasks that you perform and that didn't get automated. And that effect is captured by output appearing in that equation. So automation has two effects on a group. It reduces their gamma G, but it also increases output. And so the effect is going to be ambiguous. And that's part of what we're going to try to explore today with this model. And the final point that I want to make is that in this economy, you can also compute the labor share. And the labor share is just a decreasing function of the share of tasks that are allocated to capital. So there's also something very interesting here because the traditional way in which we think about the labor share is by saying that innovations that make capital more productive are going to reduce the labor share if and only if the elasticity of substitution is greater than one. But in this model, that's not necessarily the case. In this model, we are going to see that innovations that increase the range of tasks allocated to capital are always going to reduce the labor share independently of the elasticity of substitution. So I can get in more details into what that is the case, but that's also showing that this model thinks in a very different way than previous models in the literature. Is there any question about the model? Yeah. But for I have I have one question um, regarding the like this aggregate C C S A model. Um, yes, Luciano. So, so here uh, you're saying that capital is equally so the, the the complementarity between capital and different types of labor are the same because I I remember I don't know maybe this is an old story and I know if this was by David out out or. Uh, I don't remember exactly who who say that. Yeah. That capital could be very complement to to high skilled workers or or some type of workers and very uh, and substitute uh, absolutely uh, with another type of of workers. So that at the end of the day, this this could create this this the, the premiums and the inequality that we see in the, in the data. Completely. This is something that we have here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I agree. So there are two pay, two classical papers about it. There's Autor and Kruger thinking about computers. And then there's also Crusell, Ohanian, Rio Rula, and Violante, mm -hmm. right? And so here we are abstracting from those complementarities. 
So here, when capital becomes better, a task that it's already producing, that's just going to expand GDP and it's going to benefit all workers equally. And so this was a decision just because we want to emphasize the other angle of capital. So that's already know that if capital is more complementary to some workers than others, that's going to generate inequality. And here, what I want to emphasize is that capital is also more substitutable for some workers than for others. And I want to quantify that side. So the previous one is kind of like already done and we want to quantify the second side of it. But yeah, we are abstracting from the first one and you're going to see when I get to the results that that first channel is still important if you want to explain the whole data and I'll say, and I'll tell you exactly where you need it to explain what things of the data that our model doesn't explain. So, so Pascual, to understand, you will allow, when you go to the data, you will allow the model to have both features and then you'll, you'll see which one is more relevant to explain different parts of the data and so on. Exactly. But the capital skill complementarity is going to come as a residual in the quantification and in the reduce from exercise. But I'm going to tell you like exactly where that residual is important. Okay, okay great. So now let me Good define. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I don't see your name. What's your name? Hi, uh, Jorge from the Central Bank. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you made the claim about the difference between automation and the Lambda, right? The impact on the labor share. Yes. How you are assuming perfect substitutability in the equation in the middle of the previous slide, right? Absolutely. So if you generalize that, that somehow will, that elasticity will also play a role there, right? Yeah, absolutely. So you're absolutely right that if I don't have in this equation right here, I have some right. substitutability that is not perfect, then that elasticity is going to play a role. But what is still going to be the case is that as long as that elasticity is greater than lambda, you could still have cases where uh, the types of innovations that I'm going to describe in a second reduce the labor share, even though capital and labor are complements in the aggregate production function. Okay. But that's going to be clear in a second. But the other thing that I wanted to emphasize, yeah, anyway, let, let me leave it there and, and perhaps this is going to be clear in a second. Good. And by the way, like I, I do think that this assumption that I made here you can relax it, but I don't want to relax it because I do think that this is capturing a salient feature of automation technologies, which is essentially that you get to produce the same thing with capital instead of labor. And so like a very high level, that's what I think about automation. I think about automation as perfect substitutability at the task level, which is not the same as perfect substitutability at the aggregate level. Okay, so even though they're perfect substitutes at the task level, at the aggregate, they can be complements. Because again, if capital starts taking some tasks, that's still going to complement labor employed in the tasks that didn't get automated. So I, I do think that that's an important distinction to make. Okay, so let me describe what we mean by automation. So what is automation? Automation is the following. Imagine that we have the allocation of tasks to factors that I showed you a couple of slides ago. And I want you to think of a technological change that makes capital more productive at tasks that used to be allocated to some type of work. So imagine that we are happy teaching, but suddenly a new software is developed that can do teaching and research. And we get this place from those tasks. That is the software is more effective than us are doing those tasks. That would be an example. Or in the 80s, we used to have human welders, but then some advances in robotics allowed robot welders to do the welding at a lower cost. And so these workers get displaced. And so what that's going to do to the allocation of tasks to workers is that it's going to take away some of the tasks from group G. And so in particular, the way that I draw it here, these new advances in capital technologies are allowing capital to take away that orange region. And I'm gonna call D log gamma DG the direct effect of these improvements in capital productivity in reducing the task share of group G. So this is essentially given the task that the group was doing in the initial equilibrium, what's the share that now capital is taking away from that group? That share is not the same as the general equilibrium effect because that group is not gonna stay there. So if I start automating tasks that group G was doing, then I'm going to start displacing these groups 
from these tasks, but then they're going to start competing against other groups for some of their tasks. So you could also think of Uber as having some of these elements. So we used to have a lot of people in manufacturing, then I automate some of the tasks in manufacturing, and so people start driving an Uber and competing against other groups that were driving a taxi. And so that's essentially what we call ripple effects. So ripple effects are just a reminder that the allocation is endogenous. And so if I displace workers from some of their tasks, they're going to start out competing other workers from some of their tasks as well. And so this implies that even workers who are not getting directly displaced are going to be indirectly exposed to automation because of these ripple effects. And you can think that then group G prime then and starts competing against others. And so it generates kind of like a lot of effects. And, and we are going to show how to capture these effects later. Now, of course, this is not the only thing that automation does. It also increases productivity. Sorry, Pascual, so yes. can I ask a yes, question? Yes, no, maybe I, I, I misunderstood, misunderstood something. Um, like, is, is skills plays any role here? Because how, how we see is, uh, coming back to this story for skills, no? how we see is for, for people allocated in this G group, Mm -hmm. And try and uh, and try to compete in a market or in, in tasks that are maybe more uh, or depends uh, 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 yes on, on tasks that maybe are more appropriate for uh, for guys with, with higher skills or different skills. Yep. How is this is, is this kind of reallocation of this orange group to this blue? Absolutely. So that's going to depend critically on the size, the productivity in those tasks, right? So what's going to happen here, and you can think that those sites are capturing all of the relevant information about their skills and the things that they can do. What's going to happen here is not that they become more productive at these tasks. What's happening is that they just became cheaper because you reduce their wages by displacing them from the tasks that became automated. And so think about the marginal task. Those tasks at the boundary, you were indifferent between producing them with group G or group G prime. Now think that group G gets displaced. So that's gonna reduce the relative wages of group G. And so now you're gonna take that marginal task and now you wanna do it with group G instead of group G prime. Okay, so it's all coming from wages, but this is gonna put a break in how much the wages of group G can fall relative to the wages of group G prime. So it's gonna be an important force when we are thinking about the general equilibrium effects of automation. But I want, again, like I want to emphasize that there are two effects. There's a direct effect, which is what we're going to try to measure. And the model tells us that the relative wages of the groups experiencing this direct effect are going to fall. And then there are indirect effects. And I'm going to develop a methodology later today to deal with these indirect effects coming from the relocation of workers to different tasks. Pascual? Yes. This is Ernesto again. Go ahead. Uh, one clarification question. Are you going to talk only about wage uh, inequality, or you're going to be able also to tell us something about labor share? So I'm only going to talk about wage inequality. Uh, I'm not going to talk so much about the labor. Well, no, I'm going to use the labor share for my measurement of task displacement. So you're going to see that it plays a very prominent role. So yeah, I'm going to this. No, gonna but the question is, is this model in the current form, in the current simple form, going to be able to replicate the decrease in the labor share absolutely in the world? yep so if you okay. look at the awesome. labor share here you can see that automation increases gamma k and so it's always going to reduce the labor share and that's going to be key when we get to the measurement of of task displacement okay so the final thing that automation does is that it increases productivity because it allows us to substitute expensive labor for cheap capital how much well there's a simple envelope logic argument to compute this so the gains in productivity from substituting workers of group G for machinery or capital are just given by the share of worker of group G in GDP, that's SLG, times the share of tasks where the substitution is taking place, times the cost saving gains from this process of automation, so that's pi G. The only restriction that theory imposes is that pi G has to be positive. Right, so if pi g is greater than zero, pi g is the difference between producing in the cost of producing the task with human labor versus machinery. And so the substitution is going to take place when the human labor is more expensive than the machinery, and pi g is the gap in cost, the percent gap in cost. So imagine that 
we come up with a software that can do research at a 30% lower cost than humans, then PyG in that case is going to be 30%. But what you can see here is that in principle, you could have displacement by technologies that have a very small PyG, a PyG of 10%. And so the productivity gains of displacing a particular group for from many of the tasks can be a very small number. And that's going to be at the root of this finding that I mentioned initially that in this model, you can have sizable inequality, even though productivity gains are not going to be skyrocketing, but you're going to get very modest productivity gains out of this replacement process. So let me show you the key result from the model. Let me assume that there are no ripple effects. So Luciano, going back to your question here, I just want to capture the direct effects of automation. When I get to the quantitative section at the end, I'll tell you how you can incorporate ripple effects into our estimation and into our exercise. But right now, just assume that essentially the skills of these different groups are such that they cannot go and take additional tasks. So you could think that this is kind of like a scenario where the retraining institutions or where the relocation institutions are not working properly. And so they're stuck to their own set of tasks. And this is just measuring the direct effects of automation. So in this case, we can show that the changes in the wage of a group are given by two terms, the gains in output. This is the productivity effect. This is the complementary side of capital going back to a question that was asked earlier. And then you have the task displacement effect, which is the direct loss of tasks due to automation. So now you can see very clearly that for each group of workers, these two effects are going to play in opposite directions. You get output is expanding because of automation, but if you lose many tasks to automation, maybe your real wages are going to go down. What about the level of wages? Because this equation is only telling us something about relative wages, since it depends on the expansion of output. Well, the level of wages is going to depend on how much productivity goes up, and that's going to depend on the pi G's. So again, think of a situation where pi G is small, you're actually going to see that the pi G of 30%, which is not small, but, but, but it's in line with empirical evidence, is going to do the trick. Then you can have a small expansion in TFP, a small average increase in wages, and at the same time, some groups are losing plenty of their tasks, and you're going to have lots of inequality. So in a nutshell, that's what this model is capable of generating. And of course, for those groups that are experiencing a lot of the displacement, the real wages are going to go down as well. Okay. So this is the equation that I'm going to take to the data. Now in the data, let me actually skip this part and skip this part because I want to get to the data right away. And so what I'm going to do right now is to describe a method for measuring task displacement. So what's the idea? I need a measure of what's the share of tasks lost by every single worker in the economy due to automation. Okay, so that's difficult because we don't observe that. We don't observe that. And so we need to make assumptions in order to measure it. So this is what we're going to do. We are going to start by making the assumption that only routine tasks can be automated. So that makes sense. That's in line with a lot of literature that suggests that routine tasks are precisely the ones that are easy to automate given existing technologies. So what's a routine task? It's something that follows easily codifiable instructions. So welding is a routine task because the car always comes in the same position at the same time. And so it's very repetitive. You can very easily code an algorithm to do the welding. Whereas other things such as research are not routine because there are many contingencies and unforeseen circumstances. And so they're harder to automate even existing technologies. That's the first assumption that we're going to make. And the second assumption is something that is going to let us apportionate the total amount of automation or the total amount of displacement taking place in one industry between different groups. And so in particular, we are going to assume that all workers employed at routine tasks within a given industry are being displaced from these routine tasks at the same rate, independently of their identity. And in the paper, we provide some evidence. So this is essentially saying that the nature of the task that you're doing is a sufficient statistic for where you get displaced or not. But your identity is not important once I know the types of tasks that you're doing. 
So that's the key assumption that we need to make. Now, once you make this assumption, which I think is reasonable, you can show that you can measure task displacement as a sum of three terms. And this is a sum across industries because I didn't have time to show you, but you can extend the model to a multi-sector version. And the multi-industry version is important because in the data, when we look at automation, there's lots of heterogeneity across industries. So there's industries where there's a lot of automation and others where there's not so much automation. And so you want to account for that in the measurement. So we are summing the task displacement experienced by a group G is a sum across all industries in the economy of three terms. The first term, omega GI, is the share of wages earned by that group in industry I. So this is telling us whether that group specializes in industry I, how important is industry I for this group? So that's typical and that's kind of like the usual Bartik style measure. Now the second term, which is more interesting, is the reveal comparative advantage in routine jobs of workers of group G in industry I. So this is accounting for the incidence of automation within that industry. What's the key idea? If you are the only one in your industry that is doing routine jobs, then I'm gonna say that all of the automation on that industry is falling on top of you. But if you are in an industry where many other workers are doing routine jobs and I see the same amount of automation, I'm going to conclude that you're experiencing a lower share of that displacement because that falls evenly across all workers because of the assumption that I make. Now, the third part that you need for the measurement, and this is going back to Ernesto's question, is the following. So now we need a measure of how much displacement or task displacement is taking place in each industry. And this is complicated because like, if you think about our data, maybe I can see measures of in, uh, investment in automation technologies or the number of robots per industry or whether ro industries are using software or not. But these measures are, in a sense, ordinal. They do not map to how much displacement there is in that industry, which is the exact object that we need to measure. And here is where our model comes in handy because our model tells us, well, the key object that you need to measure is how much has the labor share in that industry decline due to automation. So the labor share decline in an industry that is due to automation is the correct metric of how much task displacement have workers experienced in that industry as a whole. So this is where the connection to the labor share is going to come in. But this also presents a challenge because in the data, I see the decline in the labor share across industries, but I don't know what part of the decline is due to automation what part is due to markups, what part is due to international trade offshoring, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I need to find a way to compute the share or the component of the decline of the labor share that can be explained or that can be attributed to automation technologies. So in this presentation, I'm gonna do two things. The first approach that I'm gonna follow is that I'm gonna to take the entire decline in the labor share of an industry, and I'm gonna call that automation. So that's essentially, let's forget about all of the potential drivers of the labor share, and let me call, let me argue, or let me make the assumption that all of the decline in the labor share is due to automation. Of course, that's not very useful because we know that markups might be increasing, changes in unionization might affect the labor share and so on, and so we have to deal in the paper by controlling for all of these potential forces. Our second strategy, which I like better, is that we are going to use explicit measures of automation, and we are going to run industry-level regressions of the labor share change against our measures of automation across industries. And we are going to take the predicted component from that regression, and we are going to call it the labor share decline that is due to automation technologies. Okay, so this is essentially predicting how much of the labor share decline across industries can be explained by proxies of automation and taking only that component, not the total decline in the labor share, and using it as a metric of automation. So let me show you how this works because Pascal? you're also going to get a very interesting finding out of this. Yes, go ahead. Before, before going there, mm -hmm. uh, something that I can think 
of, from the second strategy is that there could be some, at least the model that you show us has to do with a direct effect of automation and task uh, assignment across groups, but there could be some indirect effect of automation. For instance, if you allow the different groups to change in relative sizes, or this other stuff that you were talking about, unionization or markups also may be related somehow to automation. Yeah. So are you going to try to, cap to capture the whole effect of automation or isolate only the part that belongs to the model that you, you show us? Ernesto, great question. So what we are gonna try to do is just capture the direct effect, which is what our theory tells us that you should be measuring. So like, I wanna measure the shock. The shock is just the direct effect. And the way that we are gonna deal with all of those other potential, sorry, I think, that, are you saying something, Ernesto? I cannot, I cannot hear you, but I don't know if you're saying something. Yeah, Ernesto, you're muted. Yeah. Sorry. With these regressions, uh, uh, I can, I think you're gonna be able to capture the whole effect, not the direct effect. Absolutely. So what we're going to do is that in the regressions, we need to remove the endogenous component by using estimates of the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor and removing the part that is coming because of changes in wages, the part that is coming from markups. And then once we remove those parts, we are going to regress that residual on our measures of automation. And that's what we're going to call the direct effect. I still don't see, I mean, it's a small, it's a, it's a small command in a, in a whole very nice and pretty good strategy. But it is still, I don't see that you're going to be able to remove everything that is not indirect. Absolutely. So, so let me, let me get to that. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you like exactly what assumptions I need to make in a couple of slides, but I agree that's, that's kind of like the key part. The key part is that we can filter all of these endogenous objects that are affecting the labor share and retain the direct effects of automation. And that's what I'm going to try to convince you that, that we can do to some extent, maybe not perfectly, but I do think that we can do it to some extent. Okay. Good. So let me show you some of the data and we'll get to this discussion in a second. So this is data on the labor share changes for 49 industries from the BEA for 1987 to 2016. In the figure, what you have is the labor share decline. So more positive means that the labor share declined by more in that specific industry. In blue, you have the observed labor share decline. And in orange, you have this measure, which is a projection of the labor share decline after removing the effect of factor prices and markups regressed on our measures of automation. So I'll get in a second to the construction of this measure, but you can think of the orange line as the predicted component or of the decline in the labor share that is due to automation. So I want to emphasize two points. The first point is that there's a lot of heterogeneity across industries when we are looking at the decline in the labor share. So explanations that are kind of like saying that the decline in the labor share is because of something that is happening in the economy as a whole, they're not going to explain all of this heterogeneity. In some industries, you get very large declines in the labor share. In others, such as agriculture and farming and apparel and leather, the labor share has actually been increasing recently. In agriculture, you can think that part of this is the movement to more organic and labor intensive agricultural practices. And same for apparel and leather, we are moving to like more high luxury, more labor intensive brands. So maybe that's what's driving the increase in the labor share there. Now, the second thing that I wanna emphasize is that the orange line, which is again, the component of the labor share decline predicted by our proxies of automation is gonna capture 50% of the variation across industries. So three simple measures of automation, in particular, the adoption of specialized software and equipment and the number of robots per thousand of workers. These three measures explain 50% of the variation in the labor share changes observed across industries, which I think is telling you something about automation being an important driver of the labor share decline across industries. So let me show you how it looks in the data. Here in the vertical axis, I have the labor share change from 1987 to 2016. And in the horizontal axis, I have the different proxies of automation. So in the first figure, you have robots. These are mostly in manufacturing. So that's why a bunch of points are at zero. 
In the middle panel, you have a specialized software and dedicated machinery. And in the last panel, you have a measure that combines all of them and adjusts for the observed decline in wages. I'm not doing the markup adjustment here, but we have it in the paper as well. So going back to Ernesto's question, so like, I don't know what's the best way to, dis to discuss this, but, but imagine that you see the whole labor share decline. So the whole but labor, just yes, one, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. just a question before going to Ernesto, because I think it's kind of related. Um, because if I understood correctly in your second strategy, you're, you're gonna try to, yeah, to do a projection between the evolution of the labor share across industries against a difference in, in, in automation, exactly. in the proxy of automation. Exactly. It, from a, if we think just given that this this regression is going to be like a reduced form, yeah. If we think in a, in like in an aggregate production function, just with capital and labor, mm -hmm. what you call automation is going to be an increase in the capital augmenting technology. No, there is a link. No, between, no? it's not going to be that. It's going to be an increase in the share of capital in that CS production function. Or if you have a Cobb Douglas, an increase in the exponent of capital in that production function. Oh. Okay, in the in the but okay in the, okay I see I see, mm -hmm. but okay but but I think it's gonna be it's gonna have the same effect. So you're gonna need an elastic substitution that is higher than one. No, if you yeah, think just I, as I an think aggregate, I think, that, I think that that was the point that I was making earlier. So in our theory, imagine for example that you have a Cobb Douglas production function between capital and labor, right? Okay. In that mm -hmm. case, something that increases the productivity of capital is not gonna change factor shares. In our mm -hmm. theory automation maps to a change in the elasticity of the Cobb Douglas production function with respect to capital. Because remember that in my theory, automation is about changing the shares in the CES. Yes. And the shares mm -hmm. in the CES when the CES converges to Cobb Douglas are just exponents. Okay, so you don't need anything about the aggregate elasticity between capital and labor because if in a Cobb Douglas I increase the elasticity okay. of capital, then I just it, reduce the labor. It's here. changing the lambda in the Cobb Douglas production function. Exactly. Like a time varying parameter is what. Exactly. Okay. So imagine that you have K to the alpha, L to the one minus alpha. Automation is technologies that increase alpha. Okay, and that's the effect that we are trying to isolate. We are trying to isolate the effect of a change in the alpha on the observed labor share. So I think that the best way to think about it is that when I look at an industry changing a labor share, it is a function of automation. It is a function of changes in wages. It is a function of markups and other shocks. And the key assumption that you need to make is that our measures of automation are orthogonal to the other shocks because otherwise they would be capturing their effect. Mm -hmm. so that's assumption number one. So you need to assume that automation is orthogonal to the decline in unionization, to international trade, etc. And the other assumption that you need to make is that assumption is orthogonal to prices. That one is more complicated. And so we don't make that assumption. What we do is that we control for prices directly. Okay. And so that's how we are trying to get at the direct effects of automation. But that, those are the because assumptions that we make. There is this sort of story about the pricing investment good, what has been generating the, the decline in the labor share. And I can think that industries that experience a, 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 a higher decrease in pricing investment goods, maybe are firms that. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that the, automation, the, 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 the covariance between prices and automation should be different. I, I think that they're super related because if you think yeah. about what's yeah. happening here in our model, it's also a decline in the price of investment goods. But the distinction in our, in our model is that, is that it's not happening to capital as a whole. It's just happening for capital at tasks that were allocated to labor. So it's kind of like the price of doing welding with a robot went down. And so that generates automation, but it's also because of lower capital prices. So they're related. It's just a question of where is the decline of the price of capital happening? Is it happening everywhere? Then you need an elasticity of substitution greater than one to generate a decline in the labor share. But if it's happening at tasks that were previously allocated to labor, then it's going to look as a shift in the exponent of the Cobb Douglas. So that's one key insight of the paper. But anyway, Ernesto, I hope that that clarifies the issue. I understand that, you know, like you might have quibbles with it, agree completely, but you know, like what I like about this method is that if you find out a better way of doing this part, I can take your measures and put it in my model and just kind of like recompute everything. So I don't think that the strength of the paper is to say like, okay, we really isolated the direct effect of automation on the labor share, but it's just like, okay, this is one way of doing it that we think is reasonable or reasonable. Okay. So what do you get out of this? Text? Yes. There's a question from Alejandro. Alejandro, I will unmute you. Go ahead. There you go. You can ask. 
Alejandro. I cannot hear you. Okay, we cannot hear him. So if you can write in the chat, I will ask it myself. Perfect. Or we can discuss it during the Q&A at the end as well. Good. So let me proceed. Pascual, you have uh, 15 minutes to go. Perfect. So, so if you guys want, why don't we keep the questions for the Q&A so that I can complete this part and then we'll, we'll discuss everything in more detail then because like I'm about to be done. Good. So what do we get out of these measures? Remember that those are industry level measures of how much tax displacement has been taking place on each industry. And I told you that I can project these measures to groups based on their specialization patterns, in particular, what industries are they located at and whether they specialize in routine jobs within those industries. So this is what you get when you apply my formula for tax displacement for 500 groups in the US defined by their level of education, their gender, their experience, their race, and their place of birth. And the reason why we are using all of these categories is that when you look at the data, they tend to specialize in very different industries and in very different occupations within industries. So that's all variation that our model is telling us should be related to how much tax displacement they've experienced. And that's all variation that our model is telling us should be related to the decline in the relative wages. So this figure here shows the measure of tax displacement now aggregated across these groups. So there are 500 balloons here. The size of the balloon indicates the population of that group in 1980. And the vertical axis indicates the total tax displacement experienced by that group between 1980 and 2016. And in the horizontal axis, I have their baseline wages in the 1980s so that we know where in the wage distribution is the automation hitting workers. Now, what you can see is that there's a lot of heterogeneity. So workers in the middle of the wage distribution are experiencing more displacement. They're losing about 25% of their tasks to automation. Workers at the top of the distribution, especially workers in yellow or blue, which are workers with a college or a postgraduate degree, have not experienced that much displacement from automation. And workers at the bottom have experienced some, but not as much displacement as workers in the middle. So this is in line with the polarization literature, but the useful thing now is that this measure is interpretable. This is a measure of how many tasks have you lost, which is a measure that our model tells us that should be a sufficient statistic to understand what are the effects of automation across all of these groups of workers. So now this is what happens when I regress the change in wages for all of these work groups of workers against my measure of task displacement on the horizontal axis. So what you can see here is a clear negative relationship where workers who've lost more tasks to automation, who are these workers? They are workers who are specialized in industries that were doing a lot of automation. And within those industries, they were doing a lot of routine jobs. Okay, so these two points of information are deciding who are the workers that are experiencing a lot of task displacement. Those are the workers who have experienced relative wage reductions during the last 40 years. Interestingly, and let me mention some facts about this regression. When you run this regression of wages, again, our measure of task displacement, our single measure explains 67% of the variation in changes in wages observed during this period. Now, let me look at column two, and this is related to some questions that you asked before, and a question that I think that Fede asked before. So in this column, we are now controlling also for industry shifters. So what are the industry shifters? Is the exposure of workers to industries that are contracting or expanding. So this is taking care of trade and other changes in the economy. And we are also controlling for educational dummies, in particular for whether these workers have a college degree or a post-college degree. And I forgot to say that, but columns one, two, and three are the results using the observed labor share decline and columns four, five, and six are the results using the component of the labor share decline driven by our proxies of automation. And you can see that they're mostly the same, but going back to columns two and five, what you can see is that once you control for task displacement, there's no evidence of any other forces increasing the college premium. So if I run this regression on conditional, the college premium would increase by 30% during this period. 
once I control for fast displacement, there's no evidence of any other technologies increasing the college premium. But there's still evidence of other technologies increasing the post-college premium. So going back to Federico's questions earlier, direct complementarities with capital, say software making workers directly more productive, are important if you want to understand the behavior of the post-college degree premium, but not necessarily if you want to understand the behavior of the college premium, at least through the lens of this regression. And finally, sorry, yes, quick clarification: the task displacement uh, variable is yes. the first, the second, or the third you show us. Is the naive one or the most sophisticated one? So columns one and three is the naive one, and columns four to six is the sophisticated one. Okay, thanks. But you can see that it's essentially like column by column is essentially the same, right? It's very similar, which is in line with the fact that the sophisticated one or our measures of technology explain a large share of the variation in the labor share across industry. Okay, good. And in columns three and six, we do an exercise that I think is very revealing. So remember that our measure is essentially an interaction of whether these workers are in the industries that are experiencing automation and also whether they perform routine jobs within those industries. So you could think of separating the measure into two. What's their exposure to these industries, not accounting for the jobs that they do, so that's their exposure to industry labor share decline. And then another part, which is simply whether they do routine jobs independently of the industries where they're working. And what you can see is that these two measures independently do not explain what are the groups that are experiencing wage declines. It's really their interaction. So it's really about you doing routine jobs at industries that are experiencing large declines in the labor share due to automation. If you are a worker that is in a managerial task in an industry that is automating, we don't detect any decline in wages for you. It's only for the workers in the routine jobs. So in the paper, we present some other results. For example, we apply the same methodology to offshoring. So instead of using methods of measures of automation, we use measures of offshoring to predict the decline in the labor share. We find similar point estimates, but offshoring explains 10% of the variance. Remember that automation in the previous table explained 67 to 50% of the variance in wages. We also find that task displacement predicts not only lower wages, but also an increase in non-participation and a drop in employment. So people that are getting displaced are dropping out of the labor force. It's not one-to-one, -one, so you do see some evidence of relocation, which is in line with the ripple effects that I mentioned earlier. And finally, and going back to some of the questions that Ernesto was asking, we take very seriously the issue that there might be other forces affecting the measurements of the labor share and the measurement of the component of the labor share decline that is due to automation. So we have models controlling for the impact of other trends, such as the increase in markups. You can measure markups at the industry level and do a similar measurement and control. You can also control for the role of trade competition. You can also control for the role of declining unionization rates. And none of these controls affect our conclusions. And interestingly, they seem to play a very small role, at least in a regression sense. Okay, so we take very seriously that, that point, which I agree is kind of like the main issue with this research design. So in my last five minutes, let me quickly summarize what we do in the paper in terms of the quantitative exercise. And this is mostly to give you guys a preview so that if you are interested, you can go to the paper and read it. I think that there's a nice methodology here. So what's the main issue if you want to do quantitative work with this type of model? Well, it's coming from the ripple effects. Because even if I measure the shock, so even if you guys believe that I really uncover what's the total share of tasks lost by each group directly, then I need to keep into account that there is going to lead to some relocation. And that relocation is going to depend entirely, going back to Luciano's question, on the size right, on comparative advantage of different groups across all of these tasks. And that's a hugely high dimensional object. So there's no way that we're going to be able to discipline it with data. And so the way that we are going to do it is that instead of trying to calibrate the whole model and solve it, we are going to work with log linear approximations of the equilibrium. And we are going to see that once you do that, you don't need to measure all of that comparative advantage of all workers across all tasks but you just need to estimate a matrix, which we call the propagation matrix. 
So let me get into the details. Imagine that you have a shock C that affects wages directly. So there's a direct shock to the wages of different workers. That C is going to create two effects on wages. There's a direct effect, which is the C part, but then there's a direct indirect effect because the change in wages changes the allocation of tasks. Okay, so that's the ripple effect. So you can see that this essentially boils down to a fixed point problem, but we can solve for the change in wages as the product of that matrix that looks a little bit like a Leon TF inverse and the initial shock. The reason why it looks like a Leon TF inverse is instructive. So what's happening here, go, let's go back to the idea of these ripple effects. I displace another group of workers, that group of workers then goes and displaces another one, and then it goes and displaces another one, and that's exactly the logic behind a Leon TF inverse. So that's what you get this matrix there. But our key point is that essentially all you need to do if you want to know what's the effect of a shock, C. And remember that I told you that I can measure C because C is just the task displacement experienced by the groups. On wages, all I need to do is estimate this propagation matrix. And once I estimate the propagation matrix, I can use that, multiply that by task displacement and get the effects of this technology on all workers taking into account the ripple effects. So that's the idea. So how do we do it in the paper? Well, in the paper we show that the change in wages are given by the propagation matrix times the direct effects experienced by each worker. So in particular, now my wage is not only a function of how much task displacement I am experiencing, but it's also a function of how much task displacement other groups that are in direct competition against me, and this is captured by the propagation matrix, how much displacement are they experiencing? So this is an equation that we can estimate by GMM by imposing parametric restrictions on the propagation matrix. So of course you need to impose some parametric restrictions because otherwise it's a 500 by 500 matrix, so you're not going to be able to estimate it. But what we do is that we say, well, let's imagine that the off-diagonal components are a function of how similar groups are along different dimensions. So for example, whether they have similar levels of skill, whether they live in similar regions, where they're employed in similar industries and occupations, and then that collapses the dimensionality of the propagation matrix and we can estimate it. So let me conclude with this figure, which summarizes some of the findings that we get up out of the quantitative exercise. So first, I'm plotting the contribution to wages of the productivity gains. So this is just the expansion of output. And we use an estimate of the productivity gains from automation of 30%, which means that substitution of capital for workers reduces cost by 30%. That's in line with microestimates that we have from manufacturing. And when we plot that into our formulas, we find that and lambda, sorry, which is the elasticity of substitution across tasks, we have an estimate of 0 0.5 that comes from a recent job market paper by Anders Homlum. So when you plot that into our formulas, you get that the productivity gains from automation would increase all wages by about 50%. So that's the part we love about technology, right? That's the complementarity. Technology increases TFP, increases all of our wages by 50%. The second panel includes the effect of automation on the industry composition, because we saw that the automation concentrates in manufacturing and some industries. And so when there's more automation in some industries than others, that's going to change the industry composition. And that's also something that you can account for using an extended version of our model that has sectors. Panel C now adds the displacement effect. So this all comes at the expense of some workers that are getting displaced from some of their tasks. And so you now get all of this dispersion in wages. Some workers are still getting a 50% increase in their wages. Those are the workers who were not displaced. And so they're just enjoying the productivity gains. But other workers are experiencing a 25% reduction on their wages. Those are workers who were heavily displaced by automation. And you can see that automation is actually causing their real wages to go down. And finally, in panel D, what we do is that we multiply everything by our estimates of the propagation matrix. And what that do is that that compresses the changes in the wages. And the reason is very intuitive and interesting. Those people at the bottom who are going to experience large reductions in their wages start competing against others for their jobs and bring down all of their wages down. 
So essentially, you need to think of relocation as something that makes all of us indirectly exposed to automation and therefore becomes an equalizing force. And that's what you see for the ripple effects. The ability of people to relocate essentially disperses the effects of the shocks. So you could think, for example, going back to Luciana's question, that if people are not fundamentally different, if they just happen to be in different jobs initially, then the propagation matrix would be uniform. And in the long run, this would all collapse to a line because we're all going to be down our wages to the same point. But the fact that it doesn't converge to a line suggests that in the data, those groups that are more exposed are still experiencing a relative wage reduction even compared to groups that are similar to them. Okay, so that's all I have for today. One final number that I wanna mention is that even though you get all of this dispersion in wages, mean wages only go up by 6% and TFP only goes up by 4% during 40 years. So these are 40 years of technological progress in automation. You get all of this inequality and mean wages only go up by 6% and TFP only go up by 4%. So you don't get a large increase in TFP. And the only part where our model doesn't do a good job is here at the top of the wage distribution, which I already mentioned is where you would need direct complementarities with capital in order to explain it. So that's back to Federico's question. That's a residual. That residual down there would be explained by direct complementarities with capital, which we don't have. Okay. So that's all. Thanks so much for the questions. And I'm happy to stick around for, I guess, 15 minutes to, to discuss any other questions that you might have. Thanks a lot, Pascual. This was great. Um, so we have some minutes for discussion. So if anyone has any questions, just fire away. Yeah. Yeah. Great presentation, Pascual. Thank you. Um, just could you elaborate a little bit more about how you estimate this um, propagation effect, the, the ripple effect? So do you have what you say that you then parameterize this according to probably skills, education, some of travel variables that uh, 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 that would affect this propagation thing. But so, so how do you implement this parameterization? You, yeah. What is your let's say observe your observable? What did you observe here? Like the replacement in each of these tasks, and then you try to to yeah, uh, yeah to correlate this with with some measure of education, skill, things like that. How, how, how do you perfect? Let me, let me get at that. So like the basic idea is the following. We are going to assume that the extent to which two groups are in competition, which is the off diagonal element of this propagation matrix, is a function of the distance or the similarity of these two groups along a series of observable characteristics. So that's the part where we are reducing the dimensionality. We are saying you and I compete if you and I are similar in terms of the following characteristics. The occupations that we used to do in the 80s before the shock. The industries where we used to be employed in the 80s before the shock. The skills and age that you and I have, because there's a lot of literature saying that there's a lot of substitutability of workers with similar skills and age levels, right? And so essentially what we then do is that we create these measures where the extent of competition between you and I is a function of our distance along those characteristics, but we let the coefficient or the weight of each of these characteristics be something that we need to estimate for the, from the data. Now we go back to our equation for wages. And what we have is that essentially all you need to do is bring in those ripple effects. So now your wages do not only depend on the task displacement that you experience, but your wages are also gonna be a weighted, a function of a weighted average of the task displacement experienced by your competitors. And that is going to depend on those betas, which tell me how important is each of these dimensions in mediating the effects of competition between you and I. So this is the equation that you estimate and you can estimate this equation by GMM essentially. So what's identifying the things here, what's identifying everything is that when I see a group experiencing a lot of task displacement and I see in the data that that reduces the wages of groups that used to do similar occupations in the 80s, then that's evidence of my model of a beta positive along that dimension, that dimension playing a key role in mediating competition. If I see a lot of task displacement of workers with a similar level of education as I have, reducing my wage over time, then that's evidence of a spillover along this dimension. 
and that's how we recover the components or the parameters of the propagation matrix. I see. So, so the correlation in wages for two different groups, uh, you are connected this like 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 the, the spatial correlation between wages. You are connected yes. with these the similarity measures that are observed in. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So, like it's it's essentially like. Think about the first regression. In the first regression, I'm just explaining your wage as a function of your task displacement. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like making the assumption that only your task displacement matters. But now imagine that I start throwing the task displacement of other groups in that regression mm -hmm. with some weights, and it's all about estimating those weights. And, and that's essentially how we recover the propagation matrix. Because the propagation matrix is telling, telling me like, you know, like you and I are in a strong competition. If when you get displaced, my wages fall. That's exactly what the propagation matrix is telling us about. So you and I are strongly competing for tasks in that case, and that's exactly how we identify it from the data as well. So uh, Alejandro wrote uh, a question. I will read it. It's in Spanish. ¿Qué tan importante es el lambda en el modelo? Todos se afectan igual con una caída en un task. Sí. Okay. Entonces, eso es cierto, el lambda es importante porque de cierta manera estamos asumiendo que cuando aumenta el output, cuando aumenta la productividad, esto beneficia de manera igual a todos los grupos de trabajadores. Entonces, básicamente, y esto se relaciona con otra pregunta que me hicieron antes, que es, uno también puede extender este modelo para que cuando haya un aumento en la productividad de capital, por ejemplo, esto beneficie más a unos grupos que a otros. Y esto estaría tratando de capturar ese residuo del que le estaba hablando a Federico, que hay partes del wage distribution que no podemos explicar. Y esas partes que no podemos explicar, yo conjeturo que están driven o no las estamos pegando precisamente porque tenemos este assumption que está haciendo que el aumento en el output beneficie a todos los trabajadores por igual. Pero cuando hay diferencias en capital skill complementarities, el aumento en output va a beneficiar a los que son más complementarios con capital que a otros. Entonces creo que es, es importante, lo hicimos a propósito porque queríamos abstraernos de este mecanismo, pero es importante y uno podría pensar en también ponerlo dentro de este modelo y hacer el análisis cuantitativo con las dos fuerzas y después descomponer los efectos en las dos fuerzas. Y ahí me, me acabo de dar cuenta que respondí en español sin darme cuenta, pero en any case. Pascual, and, um... Pascual. Hola. Hola, eh, Pascual. Hola, Pascual. Andrés Fernández acá. Déjame. Hola, And Hola, Andrés. Como la cámara. Um, great, great to have you here with us. And nice to see you again. Uh, so, I arrived late. I maybe you uh, touched uh, upon this on the intro. Um, you did mention it briefly in your presentation. Is the the consistency of these results with the this hypothesis or result of job uh, market polarization. Mm -hmm. you, you did say that it was consistent, but it didn't look to me that consistent. I mean, at, at least in the in the uh, short uh, uh, part of the distribution, the, the lower skill. Yep. Because you seem to have uh, all the, the, the downfall in, mm -hmm. um, in the automatization on low skilled workers. Mm -hmm. uh, am, I, am I missing something there or? No, 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 or... you're not. So like, I think that there are, there are two things. So for example, when you look at the figure that I show you of the distribution of task displacement by baseline wages, you are right that it looks like a U shape, but it's not like the strongest U shape that you've seen in your life. Right. And I guess that that's, that's part of what you're saying. Like this is still a change or a technological change that is mostly skill bias in the sense that it's mostly affecting unskilled workers. And mm -hmm. so it's not like, you know, like if you're super familiar with the polarization literature, you would imagine kind of like a perfect U shape where there was no displacement mm -hmm. at the bottom and no displacement at the top. And all of the displacement was kind of like in the upper middle class. Now, I think that part of the reason, I, I do think that is broadly consistent because yeah, the maximum displacement is at the middle. So it's broadly consistent but is quantitatively different because of the way that we are measuring task displacement. So in that literature, the only thing that determines what essentially what they're doing is looking at occupations with different level of routine tasks 
and they're plotting those occupations against their baseline wages and they do find something that looks more like a U shape. We are mm -hmm. projecting things not into occupations, but on groups of workers. So that gives mm -hmm. like a different pattern. And, and mm -hmm. I'm not sure why that literature did it in this way. I think that from our model, the correct way of doing it is the way that we are doing it. At least that's the way that you should do it if you're interested in understanding what's happening to group wages. Um, so there's a difference there that is just the way that people present the data and the way that people use the data. And the other distinction in our, in our measure is that I think that when you look, for example, at the routinization literature, a lot of that and a lot of those measures are capturing mostly the replacement of clerks by software. So it's mostly mm -hmm. about white collar jobs in office jobs that are a little bit higher in the wage distribution. I mm -hmm. think that by construction or measure also captures more of the automation of production work in manufacturing, because that's I where see. the big decline in the labor share is happening. And so we are also capturing that lower end of the of, of what's happening in the distribution, especially for men a little bit more. So for okay. example, like if you take if you take the, the paper by author and you do their measure separately for men and for women, you're gonna see that all of the U shape is coming from women. Uh, mm -hmm. because it's office jobs, but they don't have a new shape for men because it's mostly production work that is done mostly at the bottom. And so like I think that our, our figure is kind of like a mixture of those two and and yeah, it doesn't come up as an exact U shape, but but you can see some of it. Okay, and, and then uh... This is more like a clarifying question regarding your, your last statement on like uh, general equilibrium effects. You, you seem to imply that they weren't that big on a longer period of time. Yep. I wonder if this is linear. I mean, it, it, my prior is that robotization has spiked more in recent years. Mm -hmm. uh, is that something that might be... Um, uh, hidden from these uh, low estimates or yeah that i mean that could be that could be behind some of our small estimates on tfp we also have a more complete version of another paper that is not about inequality but it's more about tfp where we look at these in like the full model not the log linearized version of the model and we still find small tfp gains so i think that that what's happening is the following so Remember that in our model, automation is linked to the labor share decline, right? And it's essentially calibrated to match the observed decline in the labor share in a, in a way, because that's what we are using to infer how much automation is taking place. So if the labor share declines by 10% and the cost saving gains in each of these tasks are 30%, that is just gonna give you like a zero point, that's just gonna give you a 3% increase in TFP, right? So that's, that's where that number is coming. It's just kind of like, you would need huge gains in cost savings by for each task that you automate in order to get this to give you high productivity increases. Otherwise, you can explain a reduction in the labor share with a very small gain in TFP. So I, I, yeah, I think that that's where it's coming. But but yeah, it's not about it's not so much about the approximation. The approximation is if you're right that is dampening a little bit of these gains because then you start relocating more activity to capital intensive stuff. But but it's not a big effect, at least in what we've done in other work. Got it. Thanks. Thanks, Andres. And good well, to see you again. Um, a short question. So so you mentioned something about uh, uh, labor supply. I mean, obviously, in this horizon, sort of so many dec I mean, several decades, uh, mm -hmm. and the response of labor supply would be kind of potentially important. Mm -hmm. I guess um, I would like to to see your reactions on 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 how that could contaminate the results that you have and, and how they change what once you take that, that into account. Perfect. So I guess that we are talking about education mostly, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is kind of like one of my favorite facts in the world about education in the US. And, and this is part of the reason why we didn't include labor supply effects in there. Uh, and by labor supply effects, again, like what I mean is people going to college uh, so that they have access to different tasks and jobs when the skill premium starts increasing because of automation, right? So what this figure is showing you is what has happened in terms of the stock and the flow of skills in the US. So let's just start with the figure in the left. In red, you have the flows. So this is, for example, the share of people with a high school degree that are between 25 to 29 years of age at each point in time. And in black, you have the stock. 
this is the share of people above 25 years of age with a high school degree. And you also have the same corresponding lines for college. Okay. And so there's this very interesting effect that most of the increase in the flow happened before the 80s. So all of the generations before the 80s, we were increasing the rate at which we educated those cohorts. But after the 80s, you see almost no progress in the rate at which people from a given cohort are completing college. The stock keeps rising, but it's just because the flow is higher than the stock. Okay, so that's important. But what this means is that when you're thinking about new cohorts of men, for example, now in the right panel, that are entering to the labor market between the 80s and the 2000s, they have the same level of college completion as cohorts in the 70s. So I do think that investments in education are important. It's just that in the US, at least we don't see men doing that. Women have been doing that, but I think that the story for women is different. Women were compensating for discrimination and therefore they're acquiring more college. But for men, we don't see that. And men is particularly the group that has been the hardest hit by this automation, at least in production jobs, according to our numbers. So anyway, this is interesting because it suggests, so I'm not saying that education is not important. I'm just saying like in the US, I don't think that it's biasing our stuff because we don't see that at least in the aggregate, men are responding to these changes. But then that brings an important question, which is why are not they responding to these changes, right? And could they be responding in a different way? So maybe this is just saying that the educational system in the US is rigged and it's not working well, and that the effects of automation would have been very different if we have kept educating new cohorts at the same rate that we were doing it before the 80s, right? And so maybe the problem is not so much automation. Maybe the problem is that we are failing to increase college completion rates the way that we were increasing them before. And maybe when you look at other societies, that's not a problem there. So maybe the Europeans are doing it better, not because of college, but because of apprenticeship programs, right? Um, so anyway, like I do think that the supply side is extremely important to determine what's the general equilibrium effect. But I do think that it's, Kind of like amazing, but in the US, the supply side has not been very, ag very active. And what about across majors like computer scientists versus that has uh, economics or, or whatever? Completely. That has changed. And I think that that's important. Again, if you want to understand inequality at the very top, but that's not going to tell you a lot of what's happening at the bottom, because remember that a lot of what I'm doing today was just comparing men without college to men with college. And so for that particular margin, it's not going to matter a lot. but you're right that choice of college is the margin that is moving a lot. And so you do see people going more into STEM types of jobs because those are the ones that are commanding a higher premium. And you could think also that those jobs are the ones that are directly complementary to software and to capital. And so that's gonna be important if I wanna understand what's happening at the top. Another margin that has moved has, uh, is people acquiring post-college education. So that has risen, uh, but it's just kind of like, the, the big gap or the big bottleneck seems to be that it, it's kind of like the U.S. hasn't figured out a way to uh, graduate more than 30% of the cohort of men born in each year since the 70s. And so that seems to be like a big bottleneck that seems to be making the effects of all of this technological progress worse than what they could have otherwise been. So you could, you could do like an interesting question? counterfactual. You could do like an interesting counterfactual where you take like all of the data before the 70s, exactly, and you and keep projecting that rate. and say like, okay, what would have been the effects of inequality in that world? Yeah, yeah, that would be nice. Is there time for an extra question? Yes, of course. Okay, so I I was wondering during, during the presentation about some other stories that people may have about why wage inequalities may be rising. Yeah, uh, it could be trade. It could be some scheming, you know, increase in the uh, in uh, education for groups that were a little bit displaced in the past or a lot displaced in the past, and there's going to be a better allocation of talent. I mean, yeah, or a lot of stuff. So at the end, I was wondering with the last exercise that the the model is not really a model of automation; it's a model about tasks. Therefore, you could do some cross-validation of the model using some other sort of variation that we may consider the exogenous to the location of task, 
and see how tasks are going to react. For instance, changes in labor costs, or I was thinking at the beginning about uh, a lab, uh, minimum wage, but it could be some other type of regulation that may increase the, the cost of labor or change the cost of labor, mm -hmm. and then see how the tasks are going to get, get reallocated across groups. Yep. Could that, do you think that that could help somehow? Absolutely no. I, I I like what you're going. So you're you're essentially saying like automation is one of the things that can change the allocation of tasks, but there are many other driving forces that could do that, right? And so it becomes interesting to know what are those other forces end up doing for wages. Um, and to believe and to believe the results, basically we need two things. We need to believe that automation has been moving in the way that your measure described that it's moving, and second, we need to believe in the allocation of tasks predicted by the model. So exactly. This, Command has to do with the second one. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, we have not done that. I think that the thing that we did that was a little bit related to that was the exercise looking at offshoring in the sense that, that, you know, like this was a model about automation, but you can think of offshoring as something that also changes the allocation of tasks because essentially it's some worker was producing something and now instead of allocating that task to that worker, I allocated to a worker in another country, right? So that's offshoring. Uh, and to us, it was interesting to see that when we did this exercise with offshoring, we found the exact same point estimates, which essentially is in line with what you're saying, like task displacement should have the same effect, no matter what the underlying driving force is. And that's what we find for offshoring, but you're right that we could perhaps think about other, other stuff. And, and, and again, like, I think that this model is something that you could use, for example, for thinking about the long run effects of a minimum wage. Right, because in this model, changing the minimum wage is going to change the allocation of tasks, and so maybe that has some undesirable consequences in the long run, and you could use these models to think about that as well.